it's easy to get caught up in our day-to-day lives and the hustle and bustle of what comes next, where we need to be, and what we need to do. Sometimes we forget to make sure to check our surroundings and to see if anything is unusual around us. Sometimes we think that if we're in a public enough space, nothing will happen. But today's case is a case that reminds us of the exact opposite. It serves as a reminder that things can happen anywhere at any time, and we need to be aware of our surroundings and equip ourselves with knowledge and tools to protect ourselves in very dangerous situations. Today's case is the 2007 case of 18-year-old Kelsey Smith. Hey guys, I'm Annie Elise. This is 10 to Life. Let's jump right in. Kelsey Ann Smith was born to adoring parents Missy and Greg on May 3, 1989. Greg is a Navy veteran and also served in law enforcement for over 20 years, and Missy worked for a local health system. Kelsey had four siblings, two older sisters, a younger sister, and a younger brother. Kelsey was always known to be very outgoing, just a ray of sunshine and kind of a jokester. She loved to keep certain exciting things a secret until the big moment and the big reveal. For example, Kelsey was super into musical theater and had a great voice. If Kelsey had a solo, she often wouldn't even tell her family, and they would find out when they went to her show and watched her. Kelsey attended Shawnee Mission West High School and was a part of the marching band as well, in which she played the clarinet. She was also in choir, theater, like I said, and ran track. She was an excellent distance runner and loved to run multiple miles at a time. Kelsey was a friend to everybody that she met. She was caring and kind. She would attend band camp in the summers, and because her family lived so close to the school, she would always make sure that they had enough stuff for lunch for everyone. During the lunch breaks, she would bring all of her friends home, and they would all eat there together. If there was a friend's birthday party, she would bring them as many balloons as the age that they were turning. Just a huge effort to try to celebrate them. Like I said, Kelsey was a friend to everybody, and anybody who met her was better for knowing her. Kelsey was also extremely responsible. She bought her own car, a 1987 Buick Regal, for $400, which was such a good deal. Her mom drove with her to Nebraska to look at the car, not knowing whether or not she would want it, but Kelsey completely loved that car. After she drove it back to Kansas, it got broken into outside of her work, and the new radio that she actually had put in there got stolen. The running joke was that she spent as much on the radio as she did the car itself but she didn't care. She loved that car. In 2007, Kelsey was in between decisions about going to Kansas University or Kansas State. Kelsey made the decision to go to K-State. However, she didn't tell her family that. When her parents were walking with her arm in arm during senior night, that was when she announced that she was going to K-State and that she was going for marching band, which again kind of just is a nod and points to the jokester that she was and always wanting to keep people on their toes and then reveal the big moment when people weren't expecting it. Kelsey was unsure if she wanted to do human medicine or veterinary medicine, but she knew she wanted to do one of them. However, her family believes that she was leaning more towards the veterinary side of medicine. She actually had worked for a local vet named Dr. Teeter all during high school, and she absolutely loved it. She also worked at a local AMC theater and enjoyed her job there, but mostly she enjoyed that she was able to work with her boyfriend, John, who she started dating in January of 2007. The two of them were totally in love and inseparable, so much so that Kelsey wouldn't take a promotion at AMC theater because it would have meant that her and John could no longer date. Kelsey graduated at the end of May in 2007. May and June were grad party months, which meant Kelsey had a lot of parties to attend. On June 2nd, she had a graduation pool party that she was invited to during the afternoon. That same day, Kelsey and her four siblings also attended Old Shawnee Days with their dad, Greg. Now, Old Shawnee Days is essentially a big weekend carnival. 
It usually goes Thursday to Sunday. There are a lot of rides, food and drinks, vendors, bands that play, you know, the typical carnival stuff. It is a very busy weekend and something that many people have turned into a family tradition of sorts. So after a busy day with friends and family, Kelsey had something much more exciting to look forward to. It was her and John's six-month anniversary, and the two of them were going out on a date night to celebrate. Unbeknownst to her, John had actually gotten Kelsey a promise ring. Kelsey still needed to get John a gift, though, so she told her dad that she was going to go to a local Target, that she would be back soon, and she loved him. She drove to the nearest Target, which was approximately eight minutes from their house. It was nearly 7 p.m., still light outside, and she was supposed to meet up with John at 7.30, so she was in a little bit of a rush. She had to get in and get out. While in the store, she decided to get John a scrapbook. She also used her phone to call her mom, Missy, while she was inside the store. John's mom had recently accidentally thrown a card that she gave him away, so Kelsey wanted to get him a box to keep the cards in so that another one wouldn't get thrown away. As a lot of 18-year-olds do, Kelsey called her mom to figure out where in the store she could find a box, find the box she was looking for. What aisle is it in, mom? I have no idea. Now, at that time, Missy was in the car on the way back from a wedding in Iowa. Her friend was driving home because when she went to leave, their family van's engine had broken down and the car wouldn't run. During that phone call, she told her mom that she was at the Target by Oak Park Mall. Before hanging up, Missy told her that she would see her at home and that she loved her. A typical exchange and phone call between a young girl and her mom. So Kelsey checked out of the Target shortly after 7 p.m. But Kelsey didn't show up at home on time. So 7.30 came and went, and Kelsey was nowhere to be found. She was also late for her date with John. Her sister Lindsay called their mom, Missy, and asked if she had heard from Kelsey. Missy said yes, but also told her to call John because they were supposed to meet up. When Missy heard that John was there, but Kelsey wasn't, she told Lindsay to have their dad, Greg, call the police. Greg was a local law enforcement officer at the time, so he began to call around to the different agencies and ask if anyone had made any contact with Kelsey's car. He was also calling local hospitals, thinking that surely Kelsey must have been in an accident or her car has broken down because it was, again, kind of an old beater type car, and also checking those hospitals and case she had been admitted. At around 8 p.m., John and Lindsay drove to Target to look for Kelsey's car, but it wasn't there. Now, some of you might be wondering why her family was already making calls that early on, but Kelsey was never late. And if she was going to be late, she would always let them know. Due to Greg working in the law enforcement field, they had strict rules about being where you should be, when you should be, and how you are communicating if you are not going to be somewhere on time and she always followed these rules. The rules in their home was that for every minute you were late, you were grounded for two days. One time Kelsey came home, but she was in the front yard and didn't let her mom know that she was home on time, and she ended up getting grounded due to it. And while some may think that that's overkill, that is exactly why the police took her not coming home so seriously. Her family even had messages on their home phone answering machine that Kelsey had left prior to that day saying that she was running late. There was a clear track record that Kelsey was always on time, and if she wasn't going to be, she was overly communicative about it. Her grandparents also started driving around to see if they could find her anywhere. Around 9.30 p.m., her grandma spotted her car in the Macy's parking lot at the mall. Macy's is about a half mile away from Target. Around 9.45 to 10 p.m., Greg called law enforcement to say that he found her car. Missy was back in town by that point so they all met up by her car. John wanted to get in the car, but Greg told him no one would be touching the car until law enforcement thoroughly searched the car and did what they needed to do to process any evidence. While they were waiting on law enforcement, Missy was searching the dumpsters, the bushes, and anywhere else that Kelsey could have possibly been around outside of the mall. She told the officers that she couldn't find her daughter anywhere. They were still frantically calling Kelsey's phone, but at some point, it did start going straight to voicemail. Kelsey's family noticed that what appeared to be a handle of a paper grocery bag was sticking out of her trunk. So her family held their breaths, not knowing what would be in the trunk when law enforcement finally opened it. When they opened it, Kelsey was not in there. A big sigh of relief, but also still a huge question as to where she could be. As they processed her car, it became clear that something more had to have happened. Kelsey's phone and her keys were not in the car, but her purse was. She never would have just left her purse in the car. 
especially outside a busy shopping mall. The Target bag was also still in her car. Law enforcement carefully dusted the car, took fingerprints, bagged things from the car, and then had it towed to the Johnson County Crime Lab. The forensics team did what is often referred to as the superglue test in Kelsey's car. They essentially bombed the inside of Kelsey's car with super glue fumes. It turns any fingerprints white, and it allows the team to lift the fingerprints on surfaces much easier. Law enforcement told the Smith family that they could head home for the night and that they were going to process everything. However, Missy was not about to go home. Her and Greg weren't exactly seeing eye to eye on Missy's decision at that moment because she wanted to stay and he said, let law enforcement do their job. There's nothing more we can do at this point. But she decided that she was not going home and told Greg that they were going to the police station to get all of the questioning out of the way so that her daughter could be found. She genuinely knew that their family had nothing to do with Kelsey's disappearance and wanted to make sure that it was clear to law enforcement immediately so that they could continue searching and following tips to find her. The local news stations were already starting to pick up the report of a local 18-year-old girl who was missing. A tip line was also quickly set up. This extremely safe and calm county was in shock and on pins and needles wondering what could have happened. Throughout all of it, Greg was shifting from officer mode to dad mode. He later said that it was easier to be in officer mode to shift emotions, but that at the end of the day, his daughter had vanished into what seemed to be thin air. The agency handling the case was not his agency, so he was unable to help with the case itself. However, he knew what the questions were that officers were going to be asking and what they could possibly mean. Now, I can't imagine being a parent trying to have hope, but also answering questions, knowing the reality of what could be. Kelsey's family was desperate, and they had been told that Sprint could ping phones. They had Verizon, but it was worth a try. So they called numerous times. At that time, due to a federal law in effect, the phone company was not required to give out the information of where Kelsey's phone had last pinged. Instead, Verizon just tried to upsell her family's plan. Back in 2007, most people had a certain amount of minutes for their cell phone. There weren't these like unlimited talk plans that everybody pretty much has now. And multiple representatives at Verizon kept telling the Smith family that they could upgrade the minutes on their phone plan. But the family wasn't asking for that. They didn't care about the freaking minutes on their phone plan. They were desperately asking the company to tell them where their daughter's phone had last pinged. While all of this was going on, law enforcement had gained access to Target's security camera footage, and they were reviewing it all. They saw that Kelsey walked into the Target at 6.55 p.m. She could be seen walking around the store and on the phone with her mom. After she hung up, she checked out and walked outside. Her car could then be seen leaving the parking lot. Seemed like a pretty normal Target trip. But as the footage continued to be reviewed, something stuck out. When Kelsey pulled into Target, a truck pulled in shortly after her. And after she walked in, a man in a white shirt walked in shortly after that. This man seemed to be sticking semi-close to her the entire Target trip. As Kelsey went to check out, this man left Target as well. After she walked out, she could be seen putting her Target items into the front passenger door. Then she went in to get into her own car. In the extremely blurry footage, it seemed like she was pushed into her car before the car drove off just 16 seconds later. Now that law enforcement had a person of interest and this was an abduction case, they wanted to find this man and speak to him immediately. They shared the footage on the news stations and the tip line went wild. In fact, it actually crashed due to the amount of calls coming in. However, none of these calls were calls saying that they had seen the incident itself. That target was a very busy one, so it was quite a shock that no one had seen anything. But a few of the tips that came in stuck out to the investigators. Prior to Kelsey's abduction, a woman had been at City River Market in Kansas City, Missouri, when she was assaulted by an unknown man. The River Market is a unique area with tons of restaurants and stores. On the weekends, there is a very big farmer's market there where people can get local produce, flowers, and other items that people have made or are selling. It's always very busy there, especially on the weekends. And the woman who was assaulted? 
actually had to end up getting hand surgery. She hadn't opened her car door yet and fought back when the man had approached her. So after seeing the target footage, she immediately called law enforcement and told them that that was the same person that assaulted her. Another tip came from a restaurant called On the Border, which was in that same mall parking lot. The person that called said that the same man in the surveillance footage had been in their restaurant that same evening around 5 p.m. Apparently, he was being pretty rude and inappropriate with the wait staff, so he was ultimately asked to leave. He left a dummy wallet on the table and did what we call a dine and dash. Then there was another tip that came in. One man was watching the news at work when he saw the surveillance footage. He looked over at his coworker, a 26-year-old man named Edwin Hall, and said something along the lines of, isn't that your truck? Shortly after that, Edwin told his boss that he was sick and needed to go home for the day. More tips came in, including tips with addresses. A neighbor of 26-year-old Edwin saw the target footage as well. His son and Edwin's son were friends and often played together. His wife and him joked about Edwin looking similar to the man in the footage. When he saw the truck footage, he put two and two together and called law enforcement. On June 6th, investigators showed up at this random Edwin guy's house to speak to him and saw that his wife, child, and him were all packing the car, and it looked like they were going out of town. They lived in Olathe, which is the town over from Overland Park. Officers pulled them over, and Edwin was brought in for questioning. He had an attorney with him, and during his questioning, both him and his attorney gave permission for his fingerprints to be taken. He was dead set with them that he had nothing to do with this. He admitted to going to Target, but initially maintained that he had not seen Kelsey while well inside of Target. Eventually, he told them that he did notice her in Target, and that he thought she had nice legs, but after seeing her face, he thought that she was 12. A really weird comment to make. Why would you completely say you never saw her, never noticed her, then that you noticed her, she had nice legs, but looked to be 12? gross, weird. So while all of that was going on, Verizon had finally sent an engineer to come help with the search. He was able to use something referred to as CSLI to narrow down a search area based on cell phone data. CSLI stands for Cell Site Location Information. In short, your phone talks to different cell towers and can be talking to three at a time. This engineer was able to figure out the three towers that Kelsey's phone had connected with, and then basically created a pie slice shape area that they needed to search. Within 45 minutes, Kelsey's body was found near Longview Lake in Grandview, Missouri. Longview Lake is about 20 minutes from the target, and it does cross state lines. So now, this was a multi-state crime. Her body was found covered by sticks. With the way that the sticks were laid on her, law enforcement initially thought that this was some sort of satanic ritual. She also was covered in ticks after being out in the elements for four days, and there were definite signs of foul play. Meanwhile, in Johnson County, since law enforcement didn't have all of the damning evidence that this was in fact Edwin responsible for this, they decided to hold him on a charge related to the dine and dash. Edwin literally said something along the lines of, Really? That's all you got? I'll be out in an hour. As they were walking him to the car to transport him to jail, someone came in to let them know that his fingerprints matched one fingerprint that they found in Kelsey's car. It was a fingerprint that was on the metal clip of the driver's seatbelt, meaning that he had driven the car. He was placed under arrest for the murder of Kelsey. And that is when he began flipping out, swearing, and going nuts. Law enforcement delivered the news to Kelsey's parents in her driveway. That night, hundreds of people gathered with the family at a local church. At her visitation, thousands were in attendance. The visitation was from 7 to 9 p.m., but there were so many people there that her parents stayed there until after 11 p.m. The community truly lifted this family up and did everything they could to help. As more evidence and the real version of what happened came out, the community was still reeling and truly shocked at what had gone down. To put this all in perspective, Kelsey's murder was one of two murders in Johnson County that year. Edwin had been scouting the mall that day looking for women to accost. In fact, 
This was something he regularly did, and it's believed that this is actually the way that he met his wife, Aletha. The two of them then later had a child together. So Edwin had followed Kelsey to Target and through Target, but far enough back to where she wouldn't notice him. When he walked out of Target while she was still checking out, he went and got a gun. It was an airsoft gun, but Kelsey wouldn't have known that with the way that it looked, and he used that gun to force her inside her car. Greg had taught all of his children self-defense tactics. In fact, Kelsey was the last one he believed that something like this would ever happen to. When investigators swabbed the gun, her DNA was found on the tip of it, and it's believed that the DNA on the tip of it came from her saliva. It is also believed that Edwin sat in the back of the car while Kelsey drove in the front with the gun held to her head. But that wasn't the worst of it. When they got to the location in which he was going to inflict his next acts, he proceeded to sexually attack her while she was, in fact, still alive, but in and out of consciousness. You see, he used Kelsey's belt around her neck to control her. He would choke her out and bring her back many times during the course of this assault. This was a very personal and truly heinous crime. He would choke her, bring her back, continue to assault her, choke her again, and just repeat this cycle. Then, when he was done with her, he fully strangled her to death. Now, I want to make it a point and say that it was very clear that Kelsey had fought back with all of her strength. After Edwin killed her, he then drove her car and parked it in the Macy's parking lot before walking the half mile back to Target to pick up his truck, and then he drove home to his city. At 10.30 p.m. that night, he called a nurse hotline asking how to remove ticks off his body. The next day, a couple spotted him coming out of the woods at Longview Lake. He was carrying a duffel bag. He seemed to get really nervous and immediately struck up a conversation with them, telling them that he was an amateur photographer and that he was back there taking photos. Later, it was found out that he actually went back to the scene of the crime with a bottle of bleach. Yes, his idiotic self went back to the scene of the crime, like a moron. He thought that if he doused her body in bleach, there would be no DNA evidence. She was wearing a pink shirt when she was abducted, and her shirt was white when she was found due to the bleach. This now leads to all of the DNA evidence that was found. Edwin's DNA was found on the steering wheel and on the seatbelt adjuster. Kelsey's DNA was found inside of his shorts. It was a 1 in 280 billion chance that it was not her DNA. But even worse, his wife's DNA was also found in those shorts. So did he go home like nothing had happened and then had intercourse with his wife afterward? It is seriously so disgusting and creepy. Each piece of clothing he was wearing during the incident had been individually bagged, almost like he was planning on getting rid of each thing in different places. And I just gotta say, guys, not to bring it all back to Brian Koberger and what went down in Idaho, but... Remember the reports of Brian inside his family's home in Pennsylvania individually going through evidence and putting things in separate baggies? It was very reminiscent of what's happening here with Edwin. He had bagged all of his clothing into separate baggies as though he was going to either destroy them, dispose of them, hide them, who knows. There were tons of evidentiary hearings over the following year, and Kelsey's family attended every single one of those hearings. In fact, they had multiple hearings over the target surveillance clips alone. The defense kept saying they did not have the clips, even though the prosecution kept saying that they had given them the evidence. The defense was given eight hours of target footage, but they seemed upset about having to try and find that time frame where Kelsey and Edwin were in the store. Essentially, it seemed like a stall tactic, but also a tech issue in which the defense may not have been able to figure out how to actually play the videos. Finally, Target was brought into one of the hearings. The attorney for Target literally took the hard drive out of the computer and handed it to the defense in front of the judge and in front of the prosecution to prove that the defense now had the evidence in hand. The biggest issue at hand was who was going to try the case, because this was a multi-state case, remember. Was Missouri or Kansas going to prosecute this case? Or would the feds prosecute because it had indeed crossed state lines? 
A change of venue hearing was set for July 23, 2008, because the defense believed that there could be no fair trial in Kansas. After all, this was the biggest case in the state, and everyone was talking about it. But the day before that hearing, Missy and Greg had a meetup at the U.S. Attorney's Office in Missouri. The attorney said that Johnson County would prosecute to the fullest extent, as that was where she was abducted from. This angered Missy, and she looked at him and said, You mean you didn't have the balls to prosecute this? Now, as a mom, I can only imagine the pain and frustration felt when it seemed like people weren't treating her daughter's murder for what it actually was. However, when leaving, staff members at the office told the Smith family to come back if they didn't feel like they got justice. The defense team got word of the Smith family being up at the U.S. Attorney's Office, and they knew it wasn't good. They knew if the feds tried to prosecute, they would go for the death penalty. The next day was the change of venue hearing. They were clearly nervous, and that change of venue hearing ended up being a change of plea hearing to avoid the death penalty. Initially, Missy wasn't extremely keen on the plea. However, one of her friends, who was a prosecutor, explained that if he took a plea, it would be over. The plea would be life without parole, and they would never have to see him or deal with him again. That made the decision an easy one for them. So on July 23rd, Edwin pled guilty to four charges, which included capital murder, aggravated kidnapping, a charge for the sexual act of RAPE, and aggravated sodomy. His wife, Aletha, was in the courtroom for all of this. The courtroom was actually the only place that she was allowed to see him. She had been banned from visiting the Johnson County Jail after she was caught flashing Edwin. Which, seriously, what is wrong with you? What is wrong with you? Why are you trying to flash your gross-ass husband while he's in jail? It is, like, sick. Kelsey's family also spoke out after the plea. Today is not really a victory, but it is justice. And justice isn't always fair. Um, If it was fair, we'd get Kelsey back. Kelsey's family said it was an easy decision to accept the plea agreement. Her mother said it was the best thing for their family. Now everyone can focus on Kelsey. All these kids knew her. It tells you what kind of person she was. It's all about her. And that was part of the reason for the plea, so we could get the focus off Edwin. He doesn't matter. Kelsey matters. Sentencing was on September 16th, 2008, just 15 months after Kelsey was murdered. In terms of a capital murder case, that is considered pretty quick, actually. Edwin's attorney spoke out about the issues that he suffered growing up. And while Edwin may have had things happen to him, he still got to make choices. All of us have things happen. Not all of us have an ideal childhood. And you still have to make a choice for yourself. Those things aren't a hall pass to do as we please. Plus, Edwin had a track record. He was adopted but was given back to the state as a teenager after he was arrested for threatening his sister with a knife. He also threatened a neighbor with a baseball bat. Two years after being returned to the system, he aged out of foster care, and then that's when he ended up marrying Aletha. Edwin had a MySpace profile in which he referred to himself as Jack, where he listed his hobbies as, get this, eating small children and harming small animals. Um, If that's not a red flag, I don't know what is. In July of 2007, a month after Kelsey's murder, he was also charged with two counts of aggravated indecent liberties. Law enforcement said that in 2004, he was involved in a consensual sexual relationship with a 14-year-old. You heard that right, a consensual one, which I personally don't believe a 14-year-old can consent to being with a man close to double her age, so I wouldn't consider that consensual. His plea deal included life without parole, the indecent liberty charges being dropped, and he didn't have any right to file an appeal. During the sentencing, both Kelsey's family and Edwin spoke. I miss my Kels. I miss her laughter, her smile, her loudness. I miss my baby girl. Kelsey's 18 years of life were celebrated by family and friends. Hall admitted to kidnapping, raping, and killing her in June of last year. He found her shopping at an Overland Park Target store. People go and live amongst others of this kind in a steel jungle. 
and they find rather than being the predator, he is now the prey. Hall's lawyers said the defendant's years of abuse as a child were not an excuse, but an explanation. But the only sympathy the Smiths have is for Hall's young son. My only satisfaction is knowing that you'll forever spend the rest of your life behind those bars. Never will you get to see the kind of man your son could have become. Forever he will have to live the consequences with the consequences you chose and made for him. I will continue to pray for God to protect that little boy. He is going to need it. I am so, so sorry for what I've done. That's it. That's all I can say. Currently, Edwin is still in prison in Hutchinson, Kansas. I looked at his discipline record, and he has 17 violations. So, clearly, he just cannot stay out of trouble. Missy has spoken out about the defense attorneys, saying that when it comes to them, you want them to work hard and do everything possible to get their client off the hook. If they do their job correctly and the client is still guilty, there is less chance of an appeal being granted. She has also said that one of Edwin's attorneys had a daughter that had mutual friends with Kelsey. He took the case without being aware of that and actually went up to Missy and apologized to her personally. The Smith family has been very open about their journey of moving forward. From the get-go, they decided that they were not going to give Edwin any more recognition or any more energy of theirs. They actually don't even say his name at this point. Their reasoning is that he does not matter. Kelsey is the one who matters in all of this, not Edwin, not Edwin's pervy ass. A couple weeks after the murder, Kelsey's younger sister wanted to go to the mall with her friends. Now remember, the mall is right next to the Target. Rather than saying no due to the circumstances, her parents told her yes. They have been very intentional about not letting Edwin win. If they say no to doing things because of him, he would win, and they are not about to let that happen. The Smith family started the Kelsey Smith Foundation on July 7, 2007, just a month after Kelsey lost her life. The mission of the foundation is to honor and perpetuate the life of Kelsey Smith by empowering families, friends, and communities to proactively protect one of its most precious resources, namely its youth and young adults. Her parents travel and give presentations and seminars in various different states. A lot of those presentations are given to law enforcement officials, telling them signs to look for, protocols to have in place, and more. They also do the various school presentations, teaching children safety awareness. Their goal is to use Kelsey's story for good. They want people to learn how to protect themselves. They have said that if someone has a gun in a parking lot, that it is time to fight. And I just want to make a quick little PSA with that. It is statistically proven that if you are ever attacked, whether there is a weapon involved or not, that you need to scream, fight as hard as you can, and do everything you can possible in that moment to not be forced inside a vehicle. Because while a lot of our gut intuition may be to be scared of the gun or the weapon or to say, if I cooperate, my chances of getting out of this alive are, you know, much more high than fighting and getting shot or stabbed. But that's actually statistically not true. Your ch The chances of not going into that vehicle to begin with are increased if you fight back, scream, kick, claw, do anything you can. The attacker is much more likely to get spooked by the thought of somebody hearing you scream or you fighting back than they would be to actually force you in the car if that's happening. So, God forbid you ever find yourself in a situation like that. Fight like hell. Scream. And it's so easy to say don't be scared by the weapon, but don't be scared by the weapon and just fight like hell. Because once you get inside that car, the likelihood of you getting out of it alive the chances and the likelihood just go very, very, very low. Now, turning gears for a second, Kelsey could have been found way sooner if her phone could have been pinged. Her parents sat down with the regional president of Verizon and three attorneys after Kelsey's death. That was set up by the district attorney. In the meeting, Kelsey's parents were told by Verizon attorneys that they did not use proper terminology when asking for her phone to be pinged. According to the attorneys, they should have used the word locate. 
Okay, I'm sorry. Their child was missing. They clearly told Verizon that and said that's why they need to ping the phone. And all Verizon did in the end was say that they used improper wording, that they should have said we're trying to locate. I mean, give me a break. It is absolutely ridiculous. However, there was a clear issue on Verizon's part. When someone calls into a phone company with a situation like Kelsey's, the call should immediately be sent to the emergency call center. And that never happened in Kelsey's case. At the end of the meeting, the regional vice president told the family something along the lines of, I'm sorry things didn't go right that night, or we didn't handle it well that night. He told them that if they needed anything with their accounts to contact him. Okay, give me a break. Missy explained that she would be following up with him to get the answer of why Verizon failed to do their job. When she did follow up shortly after that, she was made aware that the regional president was no longer at the company, but that the attorneys had found all of Verizon's procedures to be accurate. What has been said is that he lost his job, basically, for apologizing. Basically, he admitted Verizon was at fault in some way, and that was apparently a big company no-no. But Kelsey's parents were not going to stop there. On April 17, 2009, the Kelsey Smith Act was passed in Kansas. Since then, it has been passed in more than 29 states. There's a federal law that guides the release of cell phone location information in emergency situations. However, the release of that information is at the discretion of the phone companies. The purpose of the Kelsey Smith Act is to allow law enforcement to get that information. In the states that it has passed in, the act requires phone companies to release the phone's location information to law enforcement in the situations that involve the risk of death or serious physical harm. The act has saved many people's lives over the years, and the goal is to get it passed in every state. Greg ran for Kansas House and won a term there in 2011. He then ran for Kansas Senate and also served a term there. He mostly focuses on victims' rights and things of that nature. Last year marked 15 years since Kelsey's murder, and her family reflected on all that has happened since and why her story has changed the world. I think there's such an interest because she just went to Target. Like, she's just an all-American girl that went to Target, and that was it. Didn't come home. One month after her birthday, days after her Shawnee Mission West graduation, now it's been 15 years. 15 years since a teen who was into sports, band, theater, loved by her friends and family, and had a bright future was abducted and killed. Her body found four days later in a wooded area of Jackson County. Kelsey's murder rocked the Kansas City area and nation. It can feel just like yesterday, and then there are times when it's like, wow, it's been a long time. It's unreal that she's been gone almost as long as she was here. That part's hard. Like, it's been too long. There's only one person responsible. Yeah. That's it. No one else. And, and you agree. can't have the what ifs and the regrets. Kelsey's sister Stevie and parents Greg and Missy continue to hope through their nightmare. The world can still be inspired by Kelsey's legacy of what she's been able to do even though she's not here. How many of you um, have ever used a cell phone to locate a person and quite a few hands went up and I said I'm going to sound a little arrogant right now but you're welcome. The Kelsey Smith Act. Cell phone companies can ping a user's last location if police decide that they're in danger. There aren't many people that get a law passed in 30 states, and we've done that. But on the other hand, I look at the other 20 and the fact we can't get it done federally, and I'm like, come on, people. Stories of lives being saved because of Kelsey. They've seen the law work. The Smiths have heard stories of people who were able to get medical attention after a failed attempt or a rescue of a neglected baby. Their stories go on and on. When you hear these things and you see these faces, it really is humbling that because of the work we did, this person is alive. A moment of realization. I'm not giving up. I won't give up. The wonder of where this young woman would be now and changes her death led to that has impacted so many. The only thing I'd want to change is that that day never happened, you know. But then if we change that, you don't know what lives wouldn't be here because she was. You can't change any of it because then it changes everything. Today, Kelsey would be 34 years old. Kelsey's story is a true reminder that anything can happen anywhere 
and it is so incredibly important to be aware of your surroundings. Be prepared, and as I said, always fight back. And really quickly, as I say be prepared and be aware of your surroundings, it's so easy for us to get caught up in our phone, texting, scrolling social media, even as we're walking. I'm guilty of it. I'm sure so many of you are, where if we're going in or out of a Target, we're looking down on our phone as we're walking into the parking lot or even while we're cruising the aisles, texting again, scrolling through Instagram. By doing that, you never know what's happening around you or who's following you. But if you make it a habit to either put your phone in your bag, put it in your pocket, do something as you're just running your quick errands or walking to and from the car, it's so much easier for you to be aware of your surroundings. And if you're not going to do it inside the store, I get that that's a tall ask. At least do it or get in the habit of it if you can when you are getting in and out of your car and walking to and from the store. So at least that way, you're aware of your surroundings around your vehicle, when you're leaving your vehicle, who might be following or who might be trying to gain access to your vehicle when you're coming back. That's something I personally do as a habit, not to get long-winded here, but when I walk back to my car, whether I'm with my kids or not, but especially when I'm with my kids, I have, I'm paying attention to nothing but what is around me, kind of looking my eyeballs all around, doing like my peripheral vision, seeing what's around me, and always quickly getting in my car so that I'm not shoved in. So any habits you can create and a routine that you can have, the better. Because if it can happen to Kelsey in broad daylight in a very extremely safe county, it can happen anywhere, guys. Okay, guys, thank you so much for tuning in with me on today's case. I hope you appreciated the case coverage. Please don't forget to give this a thumbs up on your way out. Let me know in the comments, too, if you just think that Edwin was a predator or if there was a reason that he sought out Kelsey. Also, what can people do if you have suggestions to be hyper aware of their surroundings to make sure that this just doesn't happen? Because we have heard about this happening so many times, whether somebody's on a run, whether they're running errands, so many different things. And if you can share this video, even better, whether you share it on your social media or in your group chat, because the more people who are aware that things like this happen in broad daylight, the more likely it is that everybody will become hyper aware to their surroundings. So... All right, guys, thanks again for tuning in. And until the next one, stay safe. Bye.